So first of all, I want to know what kind of tea you're drinking. Oh, I was going to ask you. <laughs> I am drinking Organic India, mm. uh, the Tulsi Sweet Rose. No, you're not. Yeah. Is that what you're drinking? Well, I'm drinking Organic India, Tulsi Sweet Rose. <laughs> Birds of oh, feather. Synchronicity. Yeah. It's a nice tea in the afternoon. You feel like a little bit of like awakeness from the Tulsi, but mm -hmm. the rose is sweet. So it's not, you know, there's a little sweetness to it, but it's not like that morning pick me up tea you're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I like it in the morning too. I usually add some almond milk to it and make it a whole thing, but yeah, yeah it's a nice afternoon tea. It is. Support for the adrenals and that. Mm -hmm mid-afternoon slump that can happen yeah and in the summer let it go to room temp or have it like slightly chilled yeah awesome so i want to hear i'm curious about your love of poetry mm. why poetry if there's anything that you'd like to share or mm. you know add in this beginning portion i'd love to hear about your your poetry love well, I actually think you have one that speaks to this. And so I think it'll say it better than I can. But yeah, my love of poetry is that it seems to point to something that is a little bit beyond words. So it uses words and the arrangement of words and the spaces between words and words that you might not put together normally, put together, um, or images, you know, to convey something that's beyond the words. Um, yeah, something ineffable. What about you? Uh, I think um, I was always read to as a young child, like every night by my mother and not necessarily children's books or anything, but you know there's always this feeling for language and how words always had such texture and color and shape like certain words just feel a certain way i've always had that kind of relationship to language and words mm -hmm. um so i i was always reading growing up and over time felt myself more drawn to poetry or poetic writings or stream of consciousness writing um rather than intellectual books even though I have a fair share of those um the the poetry and I think using language in that way always gave me a place to go and like visit it it let me go to all these different places outside of myself but that was really within myself mm -hmm. so I think it just opens a lot of doors yeah. it lets a lot of things loose I can't tell you how like mm -hmm. through researching for this how much I cried and it wasn't necessarily like sadness or grief, but it just felt like, yes, they get it. Like mm -hmm. you feel a lot of emotion legitimized, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a good so. Yeah. But yes, I do have a few little bits, um, little poetic verses that I'd like to share that speak to poetry. Yeah. And so the, the poet that I'm going to start with is Nahira Wahid. She's a modern poet. There's not much really known about her private life. She tells people that she's a quiet poet, which I deeply admire. I think there's something really sweet about that mystery. So she's published um, a collection in 2013, and she also published a collection in 2015. And so this, what I'm going to read to you are two little pieces from Salt, which came out in 2013. Awesome. Um, If I write what you may feel but cannot say, it does not make me a poet. It makes me a bridge and I am humbled and I am grateful to assist your heart in speaking. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I am humbled to assist your heart in speaking. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, and this one, oh. This just feels so delightful. Uh, she says, this one's called Visceral. And it says, I am a woman and a poem. Hmm. Just feels so alive. Like what I was saying with that language, really, 
having texture and form and a life to it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. the Hira Wahid Sal, the beautiful white front and back cover. Great little book. So I have one by Hafiz or Hafez. I've heard his name said both ways that also sort of introduces poetry and what it is to a poet to write poetry. So Hafiz was a Persian poet of the Sufi tradition in the 1300s. And I just find it so astounding that some of these you know, beautiful, mystical, I, I don't know why it should surprise me, but such beautiful, mystical understandings were being communicated so clearly and playfully 700 years ago. It's just so cool. And that they translate into something that supports us and makes sense contemporarily. Mm. Yeah. So this one by Hafiz about poetry itself is called, Sometimes I Say to a Poem. Sometimes I say to a poem, not now, can't you see I am bathing? <laughs> but the poem usually doesn't care and quips, too bad Hafiz, no getting lazy. You promised God you would help out. And he just came up with this new tune. <laughs> That's so sweet. Isn't that good? I think, you know, probably lots of artists and creatives feel like that. I was just going to say I resonate because while I'm driving and in the shower, I get all these great ideas when I can't like write them down. Mine are when I'm trying to fall asleep at night. I'm like, oh, yeah. That little on. whisper. <laughs> And it's it's funny because sometimes I'll have that conversation like like now. <laughs> it's like, well, if you made time during the day, you know, mm. that funny little bit of, I'll invite that in during the day then. There's much to say. Mm. That's sweet. Yeah. So that's our little introduction, kind of our why poetry. And we just hope you'll all sit back and, you know, have a mini retreat comfy and cozy and something fun to drink and just you know close eyes if you want let words just fall on you oh it really does feel like the retreats mm. when we retreat we like to share poetry in the beginning and end of many of the sessions and it's so appropriate at the beginning and end of yoga nidra when you're kind of in a you're going into a soft dreamlike state mm. I think that's where we got the idea, actually. This, our retreatants were like, can we just stay here and have you read poetry to us? And I'm thinking, I would love that. <laughs> Brings me back to being cozy in my bed, being read to. It just, oh, it's, it's a nice feeling. Yeah. So without further ado. Here we go. So the first poem that I'll be really diving into and sharing is from David White and this beautiful collection, which you, Rachel, sent me as a gift. Mm -hmm. So this is a fairly new poet for me. And you shared with me, he's a contemporary, internationally acclaimed poet who lives here, but writes a lot about his, him growing up in Ireland and in Wales. Right. Yeah. This poem I'm going to read is called The Lightest Touch. Good poetry begins with the lightest touch. A breeze arriving from nowhere. A whispered healing arrival. A word in your ear. A settling into things. Then, like a hand in the dark, it arrests the whole body, stealing you for revelation. In the silence that follows, a great line. You can feel Lazarus deep inside, even the laziest, most deathly afraid part of you lifts up his hands and walk toward the light. Mm. The lightest touch.
a word in your ear, a settling into things. welcoming that beginning wow that's when i'm gonna have to i haven't read that and i love i know i just want there to be words and poetry and silence but i have to say <laughs> the laziest part of you lifts up its, up its hands and walks towards the light that's what poetry does for me mm -hmm. like okay here i come again <laughs> Ooh. Yes. Back to life. Mm. And I hear you will be sharing a David White poem later. Yeah, there's so many good ones. There is. So yeah. more from him later. Yes. Um, I think what I'll share next is from The Prophet mm. by Khalil Gibran. And he was a Lebanese poet and philosopher. And he lived, he actually passed in 1931, so he's fairly recent also. And his poetry is written a little bit like prose, so, and a little bit in a storytelling fashion. Mm. Um, so this chapter in the book in, of poetry is titled, And the Poet Said, Speak to Us of Beauty. And all of these um, chapters in this book are written as conversation between a community and their teacher. So this is the poet asking the teacher, speak mm. to us of beauty. And then here's the reply. And he answered, the aggrieved and the injured say, beauty is kind and gentle. Like a young mother, half shy of her own glory, she walks among us. And the passionate say, nay, beauty is a thing of might and dread. Like the tempest, she shakes the earth beneath us and the sky above us. The tired and the weary say, beauty is of soft whisperings and she speaks in our spirit. Her voice yields to our silences like a faint light that quivers in fear of the shadow. But the restless say, we have heard her shouting among the mountains and with her cries come the sound of hooves and the beating of, line, of wings and the roaring of lions. And the watchmen of the city say at night, beauty shall rise with the dawn from the east. And at noontide, the toilers say, we have seen her leaning over the earth from the windows of the sunset. All these things have you said of beauty, yet in truth you spoke not of her, but of needs unsatisfied. And beauty is not a need, but an ecstasy. It is not a mouth thirsting, nor an empty hand stretched forth but rather a heart inflamed and a soul enchanted. It is not the image you would see, nor the song you would hear, but rather an image you see though you close your eyes and a song you hear though you shut your ears. O oh, people, beauty is life when life unveils her holy face. You are life and you are the veil. Beauty is eternity, gazing at itself in a mirror. But you are eternity and you are the mirror.
kind of fun. Kind of. There's so many words that feel mm -hmm. touchy and tingly and oh. Yeah. And I feel like poems like that, and really probably all, all poems, they just help us unpack something that we all have a little bit of trouble explaining or we all have an opinion about or perspective on. Beauty is not a need, but an ecstasy. That was probably the longest one, just sort of <laughs> that long for me, I don't think. So where I would like to steer that ship, it to me it feels like there's an alignment with this idea of beauty with recognizing that each sort of season has its own flavor and feeling and textures and qualities and mm -hmm. how, even if it's not our preference, there can still be this mm -hmm. realization that there's something really beautiful about the cyclical nature of life that's mm -hmm. always kind of coming and going, arising and dissolving. And even though we're more in the dissolving darkness, heaviness mm -hmm. period, you know, there might be some emerging emotions or feelings that can feel really challenging for people I think mm -hmm. um, and you know it's mixed with this holiday season so there could be all this joy too so we're getting like mm -hmm. this whole range of experience and um, I think honoring some of the the things that we might not talk about as much like some of the loneliness that we might feel it's actually very real at this time for specifically around the holidays for lots of people too mm -hmm. because not everyone has you know, massive family or supportive family or at Christmas, at the holidays. Right. Yeah. And it also reminds me, like, when we do our yoga nidra and the trainings, when we talk about the Sankalpa, that, like, mm -hmm. heartfelt attitudes and all of these, like, really lovely things that we have intentions toward. But as we're in that naturally, that opposite arise, that vikalpa, and it's like all the ways we're not. And it can feel like that, right? We can be really joyous or... Mm -hmm. in the group with people and maybe feeling like oh there's a lot to be grateful for but there's this little whisper of like grief or missing or longing for either someone or something or you know that that other aspect mm -hmm. yeah awesome tell me about the beauty of loneliness mm -hmm. so I'm gonna share from April Green next mm -hmm. um, she is a modern poet she actually is somebody that i found through social media um, and she writes in such a way that her language is really textural and flowery and to me has a strong like felt sense somatic mm -hmm. feel to it mm -hmm. and it it seems like she has little poems little haikus little streams of consciousness um writings that she does and there's always a little feel of like a healing tone to it. So I use it a lot when I work with my women's group um, or even my mm -hmm. yoga for healing classes, I might drop a couple of these in here and there. So, and she does speak to this loneliness. So the first reading that I'll share with you, I have a few short guys. This one is called Loneliness. Why do you get so lonely, he asked. You have dirt on your feet, the wilderness in your hair and salt moving through your bones. And then there's the air you breathe, an inhale of anything and everything you want it to be. A prayer, the ocean, an answer. So the next time the sun smiles at you and leaves a warm imprint on your soul, Please remember all the different ways you can be touched when you're alone. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel 
the way we in IRS yoga nidra we invite people to feel the ways that the skin perceives you know even the touch of clothing yeah or that supports you're not only touching supports but they're touching back right so that there's this real sense of in a very simple obvious somatic way i'm not here alone Mm -mm. yeah hell you're held yeah held right yeah so this one is untitled if you have this book or maybe you're going to get this book we'll have some notes of these but this is on page 63 i have bloomed and flowered a thousand times in this lifetime even when my roots were damaged because I let the dying petals fall. Mm. That's so good regarding the cycles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of those trees, they let those leaves fall happily because they know what's coming. Mm. I see my roses out front shed and then bloom again. And one last one. This is also untitled on page 69. No matter the pain it has taken you to get here, the love you have lost, given up on, passed by, the wars you have fought, run from, chased after. You are still the expanse of sky. You are still the air, the earth, the moving tide, and everything in between. It is your birthright to grow and ache and change and learn and hurt and heal. Love, breathe, you belong here. Mm. Mm. You belong here. Thank you, April Green. I'm going to drop them on the same lines of loneliness, but it's a bit lighthearted. Oh, nice. <laughs> I know. And it's from a, a book. Um, I don't know. Uh, Cynthia Ryland was a popular author when I was like a teenager and I can't remember the book she wrote now but she's also a poet and this is her poetry book called God Got a Dog. <laughs> <laughs> so all the poems in it are about God and they're just super sweet and lighthearted, um, and just have such an element of pointing to the beauty of our humanity and that the touchableness of God, whoever, whatever that is, and you think of that as. So this one's called God Made Spaghetti. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> All right. <laughs> God Made Spaghetti. Okay. Yeah. And there's beautiful illustrations, so I'll show you that at the end. But first, just you can imagine it in your own mind's eye. God made spaghetti, and she didn't have a ceiling, so she tried to make it stick to Jupiter. Go so <laughs> laugh out loud. Okay, that's great. But that just vaporized the noodle. 
So God decided to have faith, all caps, have faith. <laughs> it was cooked al dente. She filled up a big bowl and got herself a piece of sourdough and a copy of the New Yorker and <laughs> had supper. And she would actually have liked somebody to talk to. She didn't like eating alone, but most people think God lives on air. Apparently they've not noticed all the food she's created. <laughs> Nobody ever invites her over unless it's communion. And that's always such a letdown. <laughs> God's gotten used to one plate at the table. She lights a candle anyway. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I love that. There's no ceiling. She threw it up to Jupiter? <laughs> you know, and I love just, you know, as, as far as like, maybe how does that apply to my life? Well, first of all, it's just funny and it's great to laugh, right? Yeah. Oh, healing. But also like she lights a candle anyway. So the ways that we like self-care is the thing that brings love to loneliness. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing it to check it off the list or because somebody's watching. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> that was really a sweet one. Good. Thanks for lightening the load. The season is heavy. <laughs> By its very nature, cold and heavy, a little dark. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's light. I like that. Mm. So speaking to some of that elemental things, I think where I'm turning into next is my next three have these qualities of the winter season in them. Yeah. Um, two of them yeah. happen to be very prolific nature writers and nature observers who share what they've experienced in such touching, amazing ways. Um, so I want to share a couple of small entries from Thoreau's journal. Nice. I don't have it personally, but I have a copy of a collection, uh, which is one of my first fine books that I've purchased for myself. Actually, my husband purchased it for me as a gift a couple of years ago on the holidays. Mm. Man, he's a good gift giver. Well, and even it's funny, in, in the intro, he wrote into it like, you know, I saw you open this book and I never saw you so happy. So I knew I had to find a copy because it was at a house we were staying at. So but what I love is it's over a collection of his journals, which he wrote a lot of journals, which then parts of his journals were published, papers were published. Um, a little bit more about Thoreau, I did a little research, and he was uh, born in July of 1817 and passed away in May 1862. So he lived in a very interesting time. He lived simply and he was definitely a very strong individual and spent a lot of time in nature. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of this book, it says that he calculated if he only worked six weeks of the year, he could live off of that money for the rest of the year. And that's what he chose. So mm -hmm. he is one of these um, really observant people. And in this book in particular, there's little sections on um, you know, his thoughts on wildness and on seasons and on man and thought and um, death and letting go. So it's a, it's an interesting read and it spans mm -hmm. over the course of, I think his 45 years that mm -hmm. he was living. So three little sharings. These first two come from the section on the seasons. Live in each season as it passes. Breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influences of each. So live in each season as it passes. Breathe the air, drink the drink, 
taste the fruit, and resign yourself to the influences of each. That could be like an introduction to Ayurveda. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which we'll touch a little on next time. Mm. Mm. I love this one. It talks about winter. Nature now, like an athlete, begins to strip herself in earnest for her mm -hmm. contest with her great antagonist, Winter. Mm -hmm. In the bare trees and twigs, what a display of muscle. Wow. In the bare tree and twigs, what a display of muscle. And finally, a thought on life and death. Mm. Pursue, keep up with, circle round and round your life as a dog does his master's chaise. Mm. Do what you love, know your own bone, gnaw at it, bury it, unearth it, and gnaw it still. That's one of my favorite ever. Right? All lines. Know your own bone. Not at it. Bury it. Unearth it. And not it still. Mm -hmm. Feels so cyclical. Yeah, and it, it feels like such permission, right? To be who you are and to keep asking that question and quit with the shoulds you know just your own bone is all that's needed to know and it's enough to just gnaw that your whole life yeah hmm. Hmm. Mm. That's gold and uncut. Oh, oh. You know, I just, <laughs> <laughs> the book is fabulous. Mm. Well, um, I'm going to read one that's also related to winter. It's from David White, and it's actually just part of a poem called Winter Apple. Just two stanzas. And I'm, I just found this one this week and it just made, it was really struck me because I needed it personally. I have a tendency um, to want things to be over or to have, uh, to see the fulfillment and the completion of things maybe sooner than it's ready. And so, yeah, we'll put it in here. Let the apple ripen on the branch beyond your need to take it down. Wait longer than you would. Go against yourself. Find the pale nobility of quiet that ripening demands. I would like a second helping. <laughs> Shall we read it again? Yes, please. <clears throat> Let the apple ripen on the branch beyond your need to take it down. Wait longer than you would. Go against yourself. 
Find the pale nobility of quiet that ripening demands. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a little darkness to share from a teeny little pocket roomie. Oh, that's sweet. It is sweet. And those of you who aren't familiar with Rumi, 13th century Persian poet, mystic scholar, and like you were saying about Hafiz or Hafez, same kind of thing, words and feelings and concepts, ideas that just transcend ethnicity and race and religion and time. Totally. So this is called The Darkness. Night cancels the business of the day. Inertia recharges the mind. Then the day cancels the night and inertia disappears into the light. Though we sleep and rest in the dark, doesn't the dark contain the water of life? Be refreshed in the darkness. Doesn't a moment of silence restore beauty to the voice? Opposites manifest through opposites and the black core of the heart, God created the eternal light of love. We'll be refreshed in the darkness. Doesn't a moment of silence restore beauty to the voice? Opposites manifest through opposites. In the black core of the heart, God created the eternal light of love. Here's what I love that it's to me is that the poets give such a validity to the totality of human experience that it doesn't have to be all light and love and that there's beauty in the totality mm -hmm. and comfort even. Like who wants to have day all the time? I'd love to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Or who wants to listen to someone talk all the time? Like, mm -hmm. I love silence. Yes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like when we talk with groups about the op that those opposites, right? It's like you want to be over in joy and bliss all the time, then you're going to border on mania. Like, that's not too much of a good thing, is too much. Yeah, or excitement all the time, like your nervous system just in constant adrenaline mode. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> right. And I love this line in this one about, um, doesn't the dark contain the water of life? And it reminds me of like, where did we all start? Mm -hmm. In the dark, in the womb, mm -hmm. that water of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm feeling a turn into a poet that we both adore. Do you know who I'm? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Mary. Oh, Mary. Oliver. Oh, Mary. And what a loss last year. The world lost her. At, yeah. At yeah. Actually, I think it was the beginning of this year. Oh, was it the beginning of 20? I think it was right at the beginning of the year. Okay. But she lived a long, beautiful 
life and yeah. shared so many. I wrote a note down just, I think this is fascinating. I think she had her first published collection in 1963 and her most recent in 2015. Wow. Wow. And this book that we have is, uh, that we both share, is a collection across the years from her different yes. poetry. So yeah. yeah, there's some of her old ones and some of her newest ones in this book. So we'll be dancing back and forth here a bit? Sounds great. All right. Yeah, yeah I just have a couple. Uh, That's perfect, I have three. Do you wanna start then? Go Let's for see. it. Let's see the goodies I have. Yes. Okay. I promise this is my last poem titled Loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just one of those that really go into that, like what's the seasonal influence and, you know, to honor that. Um, so this one, Mary Oliver, and this is called Loneliness. I too have known loneliness. I too have known what it is to feel misunderstood, rejected, and suddenly not at all beautiful. Oh, Mother Earth, your comfort is great. Your arms never withhold. It has saved my life to know this. Your river blowing, your roses opening in the morning. Oh, motions of tenderness. That knowledge yeah. me too. has saved my life. Yeah. That her arms never withhold. Yes. Yeah. And I mean that very physically, and I think Mary Oliver does too. You know, she talks about lying in fields of grass, lying on the earth. Yeah, through all of her writing, you feel it. She has this relationship mm -hmm. to that natural world that is so like her life blood. right like the row same thing like how how could you not be there right yeah and that's most of what she wrote about mm -hmm. so when i chose um i tend to like poems that reveal you know we have such this conversation about God as being spiritual and removed in a sense from our humanity and our, the mundaneness of life. Like we've sort of split the world into a dualism of sacred and not sacred, divine and profane. And so I, I love the poems that erase the line between the two. So this one by Mary Oliver is called, I wake close to morning. Why do people keep asking to see God's identity papers? When the darkness opening into morning is more than enough. Certainly any God might turn away in disgust. Think of Sheba approaching the kingdom of Solomon. Do you think she had to ask, is this the place? She's funny. She's great. She's, great. Yeah. she's like a mentor, you know? Um, speaking of, yes, mm -hmm. she's written some books on poetry. There's a, a little poetry handbook and she, um, teaches you how to read poetry and understand certain poetry and lyrical verses and certain words are liquids and concretes and it's so uh -huh. fascinating to hear her and you know read that on language and poetry and it gives mm -hmm. a new I think a new eye when you're reading it you're like that's a liquid that's a concrete I know what they're doing there so it's you know some of it is just really fascinating why things land so well and it has to do with these sounds that our mouth makes and how it feels it's such a feeling yeah yeah so this one i want to share by mary oliver it definitely gave me all the feels 
and it's called Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night, Percy, <laughs> Percy Three. <laughs> He put his cheek against mine and makes small expressive sounds. And when I'm awake or awake enough, he turns upside down, his four paws in the air and his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me, he says, tell me again. Could there be a sweeter arrangement? Over and over, he gets to ask it, I get to tell. <laughs> Wow, that's so I know. Any person with a pet, especially a dog, would just so get that. Yeah, and I, you know, I feel I have two dogs, and one of them is a fairly young dog. And to have that kind of energy, especially this season, like he's ready to go at five in the morning. He's tails wagging. He is bright and full of light and energy. Talk about loneliness and heaviness and darkness. Like it's a little sunbeam in my house all the time. So it feels like such good medicine to have some of that opposite of play, whether it's a pet or, you know, children, or you have, you know, nieces or nephews or friends with kids. Like they bring that spark of play. And pull you out of right? Like, tell me you love me, and you have to respond. Yeah. Yeah. See me, see me, see me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I like that she could live in both worlds very well, like the world of her dog and the world of imagination. Mm -hmm. So this one's called the world I live in. I have refused to live locked in the orderly house of reasons and proofs. The world I live in and believe in is wider than that. And anyway, what's wrong with maybe? You wouldn't believe what once or twice I have seen. I'll just tell you this. Only if there are angels in your head will you ever possibly see one. Permission. Permission, <laughs> exactly. Oh. Dream, baby. Yeah. Oh. What's wrong with maybe? What is wrong with maybe? Mm. So my final Mary share is called Lingering in Happiness. <sighs> so the, right, lonely, happiness, whole range of experience here. Permission. Yeah. After rain, after many days without rain, it stays cool, private and cleansed under the trees. And the dampness there, married now to gravity, falls branch to branch, leaf to leaf, down to the ground, where it will disappear, but not, of course, vanish, except to our eyes. The roots of the oaks will have their share, and the white threads of the grasses, and the cushion of moss, a few drops, round as pearls, will enter the mole's tunnel. And soon, so many small stones buried for a thousand years will feel themselves being touched. That one is so dramatic. Can you read the part again? The drops falling branch to branch, the gravity part. Yeah. I, I want to just invite everyone to really like feel that in their body and I want to feel it again. Yes. So after rain, after many days without rain, it stays cool, private and cleansed under the trees. And the dampness there, married now to gravity, falls branch to branch, 
leaf to leaf down to the ground where it will disappear but not of course vanish except to our eyes Mm -hmm. well i just have and i feel like we're kind of turning towards yes let's hear our finale do you have another one though no that was that was my lot i mean i clearly tagged a bajillion because i love all of them but no that i mm. i did what i've set out to do share these poems the mm. ones i selected and mm. i did and it feels nice and so that kind of brings me to this last one by David White. And it's like, I think it speaks to why, to what you just said, like um, it, why, it feels nice, the why it feels so nice. And it also speaks to the why you and I wanted to do this. Um, and it also loops back to the beginning of why poetry at all in the world. What's its purpose? Why have poets done it for thousands of years? So what's life without anyways <laughs> yeah so david white one last time we began with him we're gonna end with him mm. this one's called loaves and fishes so if you know the you know the parable of in the bible of jesus feeding a multitude of people with like five loaves and two fishes i think that's kind of what this is referring I mean, the, that's the um the literary reference Loaves and fishes. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. That's his repetition, <laughs> not mine. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry. And one good word is bread for a thousand. Mm. My body's all tingly aglow with happiness. Yes. Like more? Yes. Yeah. So we really want to thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you all for joining us on your Friday. Friday before Christmas, no less. I know. Like we were saying, those mini retreats can be lifesavers. <laughs> yeah. And with that in mind, you know, if this did support you in any way, just know we've got more coming. Mm hmm yeah. And please let us know if it has and how it has. It's, it's always nice for us to get feed forward. So, you know, we know what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we can make, I love making little shifts and adjustments and changes. You know, it's all, it's all learning. Yeah. And speaking of, we have more things coming. Go for it. We have a little something coming up in January. I believe it's the 24th. Mm -hmm. So that's the fourth Friday. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a paid offering and we're going to focus on the season. And when we spoke last, Rachel, you said something along the lines of winter wisdom and that's exactly what it feels like we'll be sharing. So mm -hmm. I know for me, I'll be drawing from my Ayurvedic background mm -hmm. um, and sharing some on on that the principles and of winter and different self-care things we can use as medicine so i'll be sharing a bit of that and i'm going to draw more from the psychology and sort of the archetypes and images um that you know are of winter's nature and it, it just also ties back just to the cyclical wisdom of of the totality of experience and allowing that to work its work and be the medicine that it is. So 
to embrace it right open arms yeah yeah welcome it yeah so we will have those um, links available soon for the meeting and you'll see little marketing on instagram and our newsletter so if you want to join our newsletter um, go ahead and give us an email and we'll add you to it and denny shay did keep a list of the poems we read Mm -hmm. Um, we won't send out the whole poem but what we will do if you would like that list will have the book title and the title of the poem that or the page if it's untitled exactly yeah Yeah. yay well blessings to everyone for the end of the year the beginning of a new one and all that's coming you know relationally and communally between now and then for each of us yes Mm -hmm. and give yourself permission to know it's still winter so if you feel a little hibernate while everybody's doing their big new year push no, once you hear winter wisdom, you'll understand you're in rhythm. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in January. Self-care. Self-care. All right. Until we see you again. Wonderful. Goodbye. Right. Bye-bye.